Hello, everyone. Welcome. I see participants number going up. So a lot of people joining us today. We'll get started in just a few moments. Um, but as you get settled, if you'd like to share in the chat where you are joining us from, that's always really exciting to see because we have people from all around the world, Toronto, Austin, Iowa, already see <laughs> a lot of places popping up. And another thing, if you feel like sharing and have something in mind of a goal or takeaway from today's webinar, what would be something that you'd feel uh, that would be valuable for you to leave this webinar with? So to set yourself, set your mind to today's topic. And we'll get we'll get started. So great, we have a lot of places, Seattle, Boston, Vermont, I'm missing many of them because they just keep coming. Welcome everyone, great to have you and um, I'm really excited to, to have this webinar today. So let's get started, we have an hour for an important topic. Um, I'm Eva. I will be our moderator today. I am a Bravely coach and I have two panelists with me here today. Um, I have Kopal from Culture Amp and Zach also a Bravely coach and I'll let them introduce themselves in just a few moments. Um, our topic today is um, leading with compassion, leading teams with compassion and how high performing does not mean toxic. Very, very exciting topic. And I'm excited about this because I think we have more and more awareness of how overworking and ignoring our human needs um, does not lead to long-term high performance. Um, and also on the other side, we have more and more knowledge and awareness of compassion and how powerful it can be in our well-being and even preventing burnout. So really excited for today's discussion. Um, just before we get um, started with the panelists, a couple of housekeeping items. So um, if you are looking for the HR certification codes, we will be sharing those at the end of the session. Also, we hope to make this very interactive webinar. So please add your questions to the Q&A box. We will go through those at the and part of our, our webinar. And also, of course, you can add your thoughts and, and share things in chat, but I'll, I'll uh, make sure to see the Q&A. Um, and then, yeah, let's get started. Today's panelists, I'll let both of you introduce yourselves, um, but um, as you do so, if you could also share something that you hope to bring to today's session specifically to our attendees. Kopal, do you want to go first? Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Kopal Jelani. I'm a senior people scientist at CultureAmp. Um, I have about 10 years of experience kind of in the people and culture space, as well as a master's degree in organizational psychology. Um, and I'm very excited to be here today. Just a little bit more about CultureAmp as well for those of you who are unfamiliar um, we are a employee experience platform, and our mission is to really create a better world of work by amplifying the experience of everyone at work. Um, and we do this by supporting your people and culture goals through our employee engagement and performance management modules, which help you collect, understand, and act on employee feedback. Um, in terms of what I hope to bring to the conversation, I think this is a very important topic. Um, I think... For some people, it might be something that we see as an older idea in terms of toxic workplaces equating with high performance, but I'm really excited to kind of continue to dig into this because it's something that we continue to see, um, especially kind of in current day. So just excited to chat more about um, kind of maybe debunking some myths and also chatting more just deeply about the topic. Over to you, Zach. All right. So thank you so much, Kopal. My name is Zach Handler. I am a workplace culture trainer facilitator and coach coming to you all from Bravely here in New York City. So I just want to say that I am absolutely thrilled to be here with you all for a few reasons. One, absolutely love the topic today of compassionate leadership. Also, I'm looking down at the participant count, um, see that we're uh, moving um, you know, over 350 participants. So it's great to have all of you in the room today to see you all um, communicating in the chat. 
Also want to say I'm thrilled to be partnering uh, with Culture Amp today. I already can see that there's some love for Culture Amp in the chat there. Folks are using it. Folks are really loving it. So just really thrilled to have this discussion with you all today. And what we really want to bring to you all today is strategies, tools, tips, ways that you can really demonstrate that compassionate leadership. So make it where we're not just kind of talking about it because learning for the sake of learning is fun, but how do we make these things actionable? Great, thank you both. Definitely, I believe we're going to be able to provide a lot of practical tools and tips and knowledge. And yes, please attendees keep questions coming up in the Q&A box and also use the chat. And great to see everyone uh, sharing where they're joining from and also the love for Culture Amp. That's, that's delightful to see. Let's start with our questions. So um, first, as in our title for the for the webinar also, um, why do people, in your opinion, in your knowledge, often still um, equate high performing with toxic? What do you think about that, Zach? Do you want to start? Sure. So I think that folks don't necessarily always equate high performing with toxic. I think what we're seeing a lot of is that on the road to being high performing, things can often become toxic. So when we're focusing on producing, when we're focusing on results only, and we're not interested in the human side of work, that's when things become quite toxic. So even we see this a lot at organizations and companies, people talk about, leaders talk about, oh, how much we value our team. But it's really about, talking the talk a lot of times, and we're not seeing the walking of the walk. So what this leads to is things like excessive workloads, unrealistic expectations, punishing people for taking calculated risks when they don't work out, or lack of work-life balance. And so when it comes to these toxic workplaces, what we're seeing is that people's brain cravings are not being met. So if you've heard of Dr. David Rock, he, he writes about um, these five brain cravings and something called your brain at work, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. It's called the SCARF model. When we see these are not being met, or even worse, when we see that these brain cravings are being threatened, that's when things can become quite toxic. And the last thing I want to mention is that companies and organizations often mistake being busy with being productive. So I remember one of my first internships as a young person, I worked at an elite kind of casting agency where they were known for running a really tight ship. But what that actually meant is that things were quite toxic. And we quickly learned that if we did not have something to do, that we would get yelled at. So what that led to was performative work. We was, as interns, would take all day to do a task that may take 30 minutes because we didn't want to be seen as not being busy in the office. I remember one day when my boss was particularly grumpy, I decided to take out the trash six times because I was like, hey, don't want to look like I'm not being highly productive. And again, it became quite toxic. So. I, it got to the point, and I don't know if anybody has ever felt this way about a job or when you think about a toxic work environment, but I would start to get physically ill before I went into work. And I was like, something, the universe, myself, something is saying, don't do this. Don't dive into this. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody has had a rough time or experienced a toxic internship in their life as a young person. But yeah, that's what we want to avoid. Yeah, I see a lot of uh, people agreeing with you, Zach, on the chat that, yeah, being busy doesn't always mean that you're productive. And one thing that you said about our brains made me think of there's actually research on on our brains uh, responding better to compassionate leadership rather than than toxic or or very um, um, reward versus punishment type of leadership. What about you, Kopal? What would you like to say about the question? 
Yeah, I 100% agree with with everything you said, Zach. Um, I think, you know, obviously employee performance and productivity is essential to achieving all of those key business outcomes that organizations are, are looking for. But it is when we focus solely on those outcomes that can lead to organizations to almost like over index on performance and productivity metrics, um, which is when we can kind of see some of those toxic behaviors and a toxic culture arise. Um, and we know by now through the research that you were mentioning too, that at the heart, culture is at the heart of the organization and it should be prioritized because it is so crucial. And when we are in moments of like high pressure or when we're strapped for resources, we can kind of slip into some of those um, less conducive behaviors. Um, even now, like given the current climate, many companies, particularly in tech or those that have gone through layoffs recently, have actually found that those workplace cultures are actually becoming increasingly toxic. Um, we've done some research on organizations who've recently gone through layoffs and 45% of employees actually believe that um, the that the toxic culture at their organization has intensified as a result of some of those layoffs, given the high pressure, given kind of being strapped for resources and the additional um, workload on, on those remaining employees. Um, and I think, you know, most of us and, and a lot of you listening can agree that, you know, having a high performing organization, those types of organizations are actually prioritizing um, compassion and like lessening the impacts of some of those toxic behaviors for long-term success. And it's not only performance that's impacted, you know, at the very worst, toxic behaviors are, you know, creating real mental health problems for, for employees at their organizations, but even at moderate levels, we're seeing an impact on organizational performance. So um, certainly something that we we need to rethink and reconsider and be more intentional about because um, as Zach mentioned as well, it's something that we can pretty easily slip into when when pressure is is high. Yeah, and I think you bring up an important point also that why things go to that point. And oftentimes it's when there's more fear and, and it's understandable, not that it's good, but it's it makes sense that, that when we're afraid of even basic safety, having our work and job existing, um, it's easy to do too much and, and go to that more toxic culture at work. Um, well then, how do you define compassionate leadership? What does it look like and how does it contribute to engagement, performance and well-being? Kopal, can I let you go first? Um, so compassionate leadership um, is really leading with empathy through intentional action. And, and that intentional action is, you know, alleviating potentially problematic or toxic situations. It's encouraging leaders to take care of themselves and their teams. Um, I think sometimes we equate compassionate leadership with just empathy, but there's that second piece, a part of that formula of actually taking, ac taking action on that empathy. Um, an example is like, say you and your direct report are doing a performance review. You're noticing that your direct report is taking the feedback maybe a little bit harder than usual. They might be on the verge of tears. The empathy piece would be, you know, detecting this and asking if that, asking the your direct report if they're doing okay. Say, say that they share that maybe there was a, a something that happened, you know, the day before a death in the family. The compassion piece, the kind of action piece, would be pausing the conversation, rescheduling the rest of the review for a later date, letting the employee take the time that they need, providing appropriate support and resources, and and really showing care in that way through that intentional action. Um, in terms of those key skills, obviously emotional intelligence, I think is is kind of the core of what compassionate inte compassionate um, leadership is. So that involves, you know, not only being able to understand and manage um, your own emotions, but also others' emotions, and that is going to lead to having you know greater understanding and empathy for yourself and also those around you. Um, I always like to also speak to the piece of you know, biases. So I think a big part of compassionate leadership is also identifying and addressing your own potential biases, which can influence how you understand your and others' emotions and therefore kind of how you act based on that. So doing that work internally to, to hone um, how you show up and how you practice compassionate leadership um, is also, I think, a core piece. Um, and just that final part of the question in terms of, you know, how does compassionate leadership contribute to 
those outcomes that we all are really looking for, higher engagement, performance, well-being. Um, we have found in the research a direct connection between compassionate leadership and engagement. Um, in fact, there's evidence that employees' commitment to an organization, which is a key component of engagement, comes largely from feeling belonging and feeling valued by their leaders. Um, and we've also found that when an employee has a manager that they see as a role model or leads by example, they actually are 27% more motivated, um, which is a key facet of engagement as well, that motivation piece. Um, we see it lead to greater performance of individuals and teams. And we also know there's a direct connection between engagement and performance too. So those more engaged teams as a result of that compassionate leadership will also lead to higher performance as well. Absolutely, yeah, you, you bring up a very important <laughs> important point of um what makes me think of i think simon sinek said that um leaders should think um less being in charge and more those who they are in charge of and going back to the intention that you spoke about i think that's that's a very important starting point to create more compassionate working culture zach you want to add to that yeah so absolutely plus one to everything copal just said one thing that really kind of stuck out to me, which was when we talk about compassionate leadership, of course, we're talking about leading with your humanity. So we're talking about empathy. We're talking about active listening and validation, open communication, follow through, the demonstration of integrity, inclusiveness. But something also that Copel mentioned, which I thought was so important, is it has to be that plus the action of that. It can't just be the talking about it. It can't just be that, hey, we put it on a sheet of paper. Empathy is our policy. It has to be the demonstration of that empathy. And to do that, just like Copel mentioned, these leaders, they're going to need emotional intelligence. And people always ask, you know, what, what is it are we exactly training our leaders in when you talk about training them in emotional intelligence? And it's really about four areas. One is self-awareness. So we're talking about first leaders' own mindset and their own energy. What are your leaders' beliefs? Are they stepping into situations with a scarcity mindset? Are they stepping into situations with a fixed mindset? Or do they have a mindset that's more of growth, more of one of abundance? Also social awareness, the ability to read people in situations. A lot of times when we think about demonstrating compassion, it's about being able to read a situation to, that, so that you know compassion is necessary. Also, self-management, being able to manage your responses to things, and this includes emotional regulation. I don't know if anybody has ever had a leader who kind of has a short fuse, yells, not so great with the emotional regulation. The amygdala is often popping for that person. Well, it makes you feel unsafe. It makes you feel like you are in a toxic work environment. And finally, once you have that self-awareness, you have that social awareness, you have that self-management, then you can start to practice relationship management as a leader, really build high quality rapport and drive action. And again, the question around how this improves things for folks, how this contributes to engagement, well, when we're given the things our brains crave, again, the status, when we're given the certainty, when we're given the autonomy, the relatedness, and the sense of fairness, when we're given these things, then we're more motivated to work harder. And of course, we want leaders who are going to praise us. We want leaders who are going to recognize us, focus on our well-being, and who really care about our development, who will coach us. We don't want somebody just pushing us and pushing us and pushing us to be productive until we burn out. Absolutely. Um, and you also brought up fears and feeling safety, and we'll go to that in just a moment. But I want to pick up a question from the Q&A, and I think, um, Kopal, you could you could help answering this, maybe Zach too, but I think this is uh, directed more to Kopal. So Cindy is asking that when we're discussing improved performance in the studies, are those um, self-reported performance metrics, um, higher performance as related by managers, or performance? as measured by meeting goals. Can you give some light to that? 
Yeah, I think in the particular um, research that we've done internally, it was specifically some key, um, it was based on manager ratings and, and the individual's performance. Um, but I know there's a lot of data as well to suggest that performance, both at the organizational level, so key business metrics, um, we're also seeing improvements in those in terms of engagement. Great, thank you. And I'll pick another question for Zach uh, from anonymous attendee who's asking that there's a CEO in the company who comes from a very secretive organization and they in this company have very transparent leadership. So how do people in this organization gently nudge this new leader toward more transparency? Do you have an answer for that? Yeah, so a couple ideas. One is um, if, if your team collects feedback, so something like a 360, something like an opportunity to, to kind of give this leader feedback in a way that is already baked in to the process. So um, shout out to CultureAmp. I know you all have great feedback tools and things like that. So if you have ways of, of giving a leader feedback, um, that's 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 an important important thing. So again, something like a tool um, where they're already getting the feedback. It's just a normal thing to let them know, hey, um, you know, this may be a little out of step with the culture that we want here. And so if that leader is seeing that, um, again, choosing not to take it personally. Um, and again, the way that company and organizations that they're moving towards is towards more of a culture of transparency. Um, this idea that you know, hey, the CEO's over here. It's like, well, I'm just going to tweet him. If I can't get him in a meeting, uh, there's access, you know? So we've changed, we've uh, we've changed that. And also, yo, I just saw something in the in the chat that I love as it relates to these leaders. Q-tip, quit taking it personally. Just because you come from a secretive organization in the past, the culture may be different in the new one. So again, instead of taking it personally, taking it on your ego, just again leading into that service leadership. Absolutely, yeah. I think the being in service or a servant leader is very connected to compassion. So how can I be of service to people? And also, what you brought up there is um, how we should always remind, especially ourselves, that we should be talking about performance and the work, and not so much of us as people and person when it comes to how our work is going so really keeping it off the personal side like it's it's my work performance rather than than um than me as a person um talking but you brought both brought up um the safety aspect here and of course psychological safety feeling that you can openly share ideas and ask questions without getting any negative consequences and having that trust in an organization is very important for compassionate culture um how can leaders foster psychological safety and how is all this connected to being more innovative and having more cohesive teams. I'll give it this time first to Kopal. <laughs> awesome. This is such an important concept because humans have like psychologically an inherent need and desire for security. And if we don't feel safe, it's really hard for us to focus on anything else. It creates extra invisible labor, um, which is going to make us less effective in our roles. So psychological safety, I, I always love talking about it. And I think it's so important um, in terms of how it impacts innovation and team cohesion. There's multiple ways that psychological safety we found has benefits in an organization that includes, you know, more innovation, better creativity. So people will feel that they have the space and encouragement to chime in, even with their most kind of out of the box ideas which will push the team in order to think creatively rather than maybe stick with the status quo. Um, it often leads to a more supportive culture. So if people are afraid to speak up, the workplace environment itself can feel more threatening or judgmental. But when there is psychological safety present, um, people can feel like they are able to, to share their ideas and the team has their back in those situations. We also find it leads to improved engagement because people aren't concerned with kind of preserving their reputation. They tend to lean in a bit more. Um, higher trust, higher innovation. So lots of benefits to um, having a culture of, of psychological safety. Um, in terms of how leaders can foster psychological safety, um, 
truly has to start at the very top. So at the organization level, top leadership, those employees and those um, leaders need to be demonstrating and creating that culture from the top. But when it comes to directly you and your direct team, there are a few ways to, to foster it as well. Um, and one big way is really being intentional about those regular one-on-one -on -one meetings that you have with your direct reports and making those meetings a safe space. Um, you know, not assuming that employees will initially feel comfortable opening up, but during those one-on-ones, um, making them feel comfortable over time. So you can do this by, you know, being yourself transparent and vulnerable with your direct reports. There's data to suggest that there's kind of that dated idea that you need to kind of check anything personal at the door before switching to work mode. Um, but that strategy actually isn't that effective and being more transparent and vulnerable has many benefits, including making your team members feel safe to speak up and kind of bring their whole selves to work. Um, within those one-on-ones, asking more open-ended questions. So those that require more of an explanation rather than a simple yes or no, um, especially when your direct reports are bringing up an idea can show that you are um, interested in trying to understand their ideas and understand um, asking those clarifying questions as opposed to kind of that perception that you might be shooting it down or highlighting its flaws. Um, and as they're responding, you know, practicing things like active listening, which are um, another kind of facet of emotional intelligence. So making it clear that your intention for asking those questions is to support the employee and never to fault them. Um, there's also some behavioral things within those one-on-ones, you know, making sure that you're punctual to, the, to those meetings, warm, kind of out of the gate, prioritizing those one-on-ones, not kind of regularly cutting them short, making sure that employees know that that is really a safe space and their time to kind of bring um, any any problems or anything to you um, during that conversation. Absolutely, yeah, that creating safe spaces to talk about your work and, and being human while talking about it is, is very important. And I spotted a question in the chat um, that I think is related to what you brought up about the different management levels. So I want to add it here. And maybe, Zach, when you answer, you can also cover this part. But uh, Stephanie is asking, how do you handle a situation where the site leadership has great trust and leadership with staff, but it's upper leadership the employees have lost trust with? Do you have some ideas what to do in these situations where, where it might be that there's psychological safety in the closest level of leadership to an employee, but then higher up, there's a lack of that. Yes. So I think the first part of that is, can be kind of behaviorally. So when there are kind of AMA sessions or Q&A sessions with top leadership, how is leadership responding to those questions? Are they practicing psychological safety by making it an open and safe environment? Or are they faulting questions that are coming up and kind of reprimanding employees for asking certain things? That in and of itself, their kind of behavior um, with employees at all levels can influence um, that sense of psychological safety, um, but from kind of an organizational level as well, when you are gathering feedback through surveys, so through an engagement survey, an inclusion survey, any type of survey that you're doing, um, one really great way to build trust and safety is to use the data that you're getting from that survey. So taking the actual feedback employees are giving you and actually acting on it. So employees now feel more safe and comfortable knowing that the organization and leadership actually cares and are are doing something with the feedback that we're giving. Um, but I'll, I'll definitely let you expand, Zach, as well. Yeah, Kopal. So absolutely supporting a feedback culture, I think, is, is key here. And this is really about having a feedback culture, not just after something happens, not just the postmortem, but before a change is going to be made, while a structural change is happening and also after the change happens, really at all times uh, getting feedback. And I know Culture Amp, you all have some amazing feedback tools that you use at many companies and organizations where you can just integrate that feedback into what you all do. And here's the thing, because I think Copal pointed out what kind of the miss is sometimes with the feedback. A lot of times, We'll go in, we'll take the feedback, we'll do the surveys, but then people don't feel as if their take or their feedback was taken seriously. So, oh, they give us a survey, oh, I'm filling out another survey, but nothing ever really changes around here. Let's be honest with ourselves, right? You wanna avoid that point of view. So to do that, you wanna make sure that you're actually, like Kobel said, 
following up on those kinds of things. I'll also say, nothing is worse as a leader, as an organization, when you talk a big game about, hey, we want to have an open discussion here. We want to have um, all voices heard. We want people to feel psychological safety. We want people to feel free to you know, share their voices. And then once people actually share their voices, become a little vulnerable, they feel like they're punished for being negative. And this happens a lot of times at organizations. It's like, hey, we, we want you to be vulnerable. We want you to be open. Slam. No, don't do it. And what that does is it kills people's desire to be open, to be vulnerable and, and to, to speak and to be, you know, kind of in this way where we might be criticizing our leaders, more psychologically safe. So what we can do or one um, tactic that I really like is something called the six thinking hat method for meetings. And this actually comes from someone named Edward de Bono. And the idea with the six thinking hat method is that each hat represents a different mode of thinking. So there's say like a white hat, which is about neutral and objective thinking, a red hat, which is about intuition and feelings, a black hat, which is about critical thinking, yellow hat, which is about optimistic reasoning, green hat, which is all about looking at different options, and a blue hat, which manages the process. So the idea with these six hats is in a meeting, you want to make room for folks to wear every kind of hat. So saying something like, hey, I don't think we've worn the green hat enough and considered all of the options. Or, hey, let's now just put on the white hat. It seems like things are getting really emotional. Let's put on the white hat and just really look at the objective data of things. And what this does, it creates a sense of cohesion and really allows for psychological safety because it's saying, hey, now this is a time in the meeting where we're gonna allow for a bit of emotion. And now this is the part of the meeting where we're gonna reel things back in, right? So you have these different hats and it really gets people to feel cohesive and can really lead to that sense of psychological safety in our meetings. Yeah, I think you, Zach, just answered really well. There was a question from Louise in the chat about what does it really mean to have a safe space and how 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 does that all work? And I think you just explained what it is and also what it isn't. Um, so I think creating that safe space is like framing it, like explaining how we work and then actually living like we preach, like telling, walking the walk, not just talking the talk, which we spoke about earlier. And I just want to take a moment now and acknowledge that I think we have we have almost 500 well 430 people online and there is such a huge amount of compassion in our chat people are like supporting each other rooting for each other's ideas and our panelists and I think there's there's very compassionate crew here today so thank you everyone for attending and taking part and asking great questions because our next uh, my next question is actually very closely related to one in our Q&A box um, where uh, anonymous attendee is asking how do we move the old guard towards compassionate leadership? Like how do we help those who think high performing requires rigidity and less personal leadership styles to get on the compassionate side? And I wanna connect this to my next question where I think uh, hopefully this attendee and everyone else will get answers for as well, which is what are some strategies for leaders to support both high performance, but also supporting their teams, helping to prevent burnout, um, and, and being a compassionate leader, especially when there are high demands, hectic schedules, and, and, and a lot of love going on for the teams. What are some strategies that you both have found useful? Maybe, Zach, you can start this time. Sure. Well, I, I want to first address that question that was in the Q&A, and it regarding um, leaders who are kind of maybe skeptical of compassionate leadership. And I feel like what I've talked to a lot of leaders who are kind of skeptical of so-called compassionate leadership because they believe that to practice compassionate leadership is to practice ruinous empathy. It's to not hold people accountable. When in reality, that isn't what compassionate leadership is at all. Compassionate leadership 
You're holding people accountable, but you're also showing great personal care. And to leaders who say, hey, you know, I'm just about, you know, getting things done. I don't really care about the woo-woo stuff. Listen, compassionate leadership is not about being this or that. It's just plain good business sense. Do you care about your bottom line? Do you care about your rate of turnover? Do you care about your organization's reputation? If so, then that means that you should invest in this compassionate leadership. But when it comes to tools that we love to use, um, at Bravely, we use a really awesome tool called the stress scale. And it's really, really easy. All it is, is you ask folks on a scale of one to 10, how stressed are you feeling today? Or how much stress are you feeling in this moment? Now, a answer of one, two, or three means Maybe I'm a little bit bored. Maybe I'm a little bit underutilized. An answer of a four or a five is optimal, right? Having an optimal amount of stress. Then there's a six or a seven, which is about fatigue. And if someone answers an eight, nine, or a 10, you know that they're on their way to anxiety, breakdown, and burnout. So Using this tool as a shared vocabulary is a great thing that teams and organizations can do. So if you ask somebody, say in a one-on-one -on -one, or you just see someone in the office, you say, how are you doing today in terms of the stress scale? Where are you at? And they say, hey, I'm at a six or a seven. It's like, all right, I'm hearing that you're at a place of fatigue. What can we do to bring you back down the stress scale to a four or a five? Maybe that's not possible. Okay, so then what can we do to make sure it doesn't creep into an eight, nine, or 10? So kind of using it as a coaching tool um, as well as a, a tool for shared vocabulary. Also, if you want results, instead of prioritizing just numbers, instead of prioritizing just progress, invest in people. And the way you can do that First, have a strong shared vision and purpose for your team. Take the time to build trust with your team and do not assume that trust is given. Trust is something that is built over time. Also, understand that conflict is a part of collaboration. So really practicing how to have healthy conflict with your team members. I love the feedback tool, SBI. Situation, behavior, impact, a great way um, to, to uh, give feedback and, and to, uh, but and I want to also mention though, it's still okay to hold folks accountable. People say, oh, this compassionate leadership, it's really not about holding folks accountable. Again, it is. It's much more about doing so though, with a sense of personal care. It's, it's much more radical candor than it is ruinous empathy or obnoxious aggression. Um, this last couple ideas uh, here. One, another one is cut before adding. So if you're gonna load up somebody's plate and you wanna put more onto their plate, make sure that you can perhaps find places to cut, see what's extraneous before just adding more to their plate. To Copel's point, it's these times of scarcity where layoffs start happening, where it's like, well, I was doing one job and now I'm doing four to five. Right? So it's like, how can you cut some of those things before adding to those folks? And the last thing, when it relates to one-on-ones, it's not just about having performance conversations, especially when things get busy, when things get tense, we're always just focused on having those performance conversations, but leave room for development conversations, conversations that are about growth for the people that you're working with, growth for your team, um, and, and what ways do you wanna learn, um, what new skills do you, do you want to invest in? So making sure that you're having those kinds of conversations and not just, hey, you know, how are the numbers? How is your performance? So to, having that balance there. Absolutely. It's about, about the balance here as well, um, but also like really being interested in people's growth. And also what you brought up is like not shying away from the difficult conversation that those can be handled compassionately as well and like you said having um like conflicts in a in a 
mature, compassionate way. And and that that all is just as important and not to forget that side of, of how to we can um, exemplify um, compassionate leadership. Kopal. Yes, a hundred percent. Again, agree with with what you what you were saying, Zach. Um, in terms of burnout and getting back to that question of you know what what can leaders do when we are in a time of high pressure and tight deadlines, and how can we ensure that our teams are not burning out because we know that burnout is counterproductive to high performance. We have research that shows that creating a more compassionate culture already has been linked with things like lower exhaustion, um, which are, which is one of the elements of burnout as well as lower absenteeism, which can be a symptom of burnout. Um, so in times of high pressure and tight, like, and tight deadlines already working towards creating a more compassionate culture can kind of decrease the likelihood or threshold of burnout. Um, in terms of what leaders can do directly, I'm going to go back to, to those one-on-ones, um, Managers are best equipped to notice signs of burnout within their teams because they're on the ground and talking to their teams regularly. We know it doesn't happen overnight. Burnout is a result of chronic stress and negative well-being, which are kind of gateways to burnout happening. Um, so one kind of tool that that uh, managers can use in their one-on-ones is creating a very kind of specific structure. Um, again, managers are best equipped to keep a pulse on well-being. So making space every single week during those one-on-one conversations in the agenda to check in on things like well-being and workload will be really valuable. Um, Culture Amp has a one-on-one tool and it aut- automatically includes Um, sliders that employees can kind of indicate how they're feeling across different facets of their experience, including workload and well-being. So it's already on the agenda, already a topic of conversation. If a manager is noticing that they're at a four this week instead of their normal seven, that can be kind of a start of that conversation. Um, And during having that conversation, listening out for those early indicators of burnout, things like, you know, I just haven't gotten much sleep lately. I haven't been feeling like myself. I just need to get through this busy season and then I'll slow down or I'm just tired. I need a vacation and then I'll be fine. Those can be kind of early signs that we might want to keep an eye on. And then later actually noticing those signs of burnout, whether that's employees taking more sick days, they're coming into the office exceptionally tired. Um, they're, you're noticing they're more distracted, maybe poor attention spans, poor decision-making, things like that um, can be really uh, important to keep an eye on. And in terms of action, you know, if you're noticing that you have an employee who's getting to the point where someone might be burning out, one of the most effective things to do really is to support that employee to take the time that they need to recover from burnout. Um, So letting people unplug from work, focusing on their health, on their health is the first step. And then also considering, can we like audit workload across our teams? Can we rebalance workloads is Um, One person getting additional work, oftentimes we'll find that our highest performers are rewarded with just more work. So can we rebalance um, some of that workload and then helping our employees set those healthy boundaries? Um, Perhaps certain employees have trouble saying no or trouble um, indicating that they're, they're kind of overloaded with work. So can we work with our employees to help them set those healthy boundaries, make sure they're not answering emails after work hours, uh, making sure that they're enabled and empowered to say no when things are um, already kind of over overloaded on their schedules, um, things like that can be really valuable. I love that you provided practical tips to all different stages like prevention, which of course we want to invest in and we want to see those early signals and and, and be open minded and open ears and eyes um, as as um, leaders and people leaders at our workplaces. But as we know, we don't always catch things early on. So then what to do when things are already already longer um, and, and developing to a negative direction. So thanks, thanks, Kopal. Um, well, we have a lot of HR and people leaders present here today, and I'm sure one question uh, that many of them have and me included is, um, how, can, how can people leaders in HR support managers? What is their role to support managers to cultivate um, compassionate environment uh, in organizations and can leaders learn to be more compassionate? Oh, let's start with Zach. All right. So when it comes to supporting managers here, one of the best things to do is to train them. 
give them training. A lot of times when people are moved into management positions, they're really good at producing themselves, right? That I'm really good at, you know, a role and I was, you know, the star of the team and I got moved into a management position. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you have the skills to be a manager. So when we're talking about things like giving coaching skills to managers, um, giving feedback skills for managers and models and tools for them, things like how to flex your communication style as a manager. Let's say you have um, a very expressive communication style like myself. How do I then communicate with folks who are then more analytical, right? How do I flex my ability to do that? Um, people development, right? We assume that uh, if you're a manager, you should know how to develop people, but people development is its own skill. Another thing is offer managers coaching. Really give them a chance to be coached, give them a chance to have the space to do the work around emotional intelligence, to be listened to a lot. I can't tell you how many times in coaching sessions, and, and again, not to downplay coaching at all, but I'm just silent. And what people come up with on their own because of they're finding their own best answer, right? And just being listened to, the power of that can be so important. And then on this big question here, can leaders actually learn to be compassionate? Can we learn to actually show compassion? And my answer would be yes. And it's not necessarily thinking about it as we're learning to be compassionate for the first time. It's our first time being compassionate, we're learning. No, that's not how we're thinking about it. How we're thinking about it is, it's really about reminding ourselves that we're working with human beings. So often we get caught up in the data, we get caught up in the numbers, we get caught up on, hey, this needs to prove this, or this needs to prove that, or you know, we have to show this to management. But again, instead of worrying about that, Give them training on the human side of work, right? Their emotional intelligence. So things like their self-awareness and diving into mindset. Social awareness, how to really show both warmth and competence as a leader. Also, self-management, right? Knowing what your triggers are, doing the work to say, hey, I know I'm triggered by this. I know that this gets me hot. And this is these are the steps that I take to bring myself down when I am triggered. And finally, that relationship management. Teaching folks, these are the ways to build genuine, high quality human connections and leaders. So again, it's absolutely, people can learn to be compassionate, but it's really just about reminding them, hey, I know you're at work, I know you have a lot on your shoulders, but at the end of the day, you're working with human beings. So let's treat each other with some kindness and compassion. Absolutely. And what I heard there many times was the training and coaching, and there's a lot of opportunities to support managers in this area, both directly from HR and people leaders, but also seeking it from outside. Kopal, what would you like to add? Yes, again, 100% agree. Um, I'll just add that I always say start with with measurement. So gathering data around how employees are currently feeling and also even feedback about their managers. So this could be a manager 180, a leadership 360 that you're running um, and including items around things like compassion or those different competencies that we know are proven to be really important for leadership. And once you have the data around those areas and opportunities for leaders, that will help you really target action and coach leaders um, and managers in a more kind of directed and specific way. Um, this could also mean, again, running your regular engagement survey and even inclusion surveys and including facets of, you know, well-being and psychological safety and things like that within those surveys. So you're understanding at a baseline kind of how is our organization feeling um, and where can we, if needed, target action to kind of make those things um, more, more salient in the organization. Um, Beyond measurement, I fully agree. Training is a great place to start. Um, I also agree that things like emotional intelligence and compassion can be developed over time. Um, I'll just add to that, that even beyond the training, so enabling our uh, employees, our managers, our leaders to have some of those skills, 
how can we also create systems in the organization that enable, you know, compassionate leadership and almost account for um, human error and bias? Like we're not perfect. Um, we are always constantly working on addressing things like our own biases and showing up to work in a certain way. But how can we make sure that processes are in place in the organization that account for some of that error? Um, one example is, is with performance. So we know that performance processes in an organization create um, that sense of like organizational justice. Is this performance process fair? Um, we know that for most people, kind of the best review, the best performance review they've received aren't the ones where they get exactly what they want at the end, but they're actually productive conversations where they were satisfied with the process and they felt like the process was fair, um, that their manager was supportive, that they practiced compassion throughout that process. And so how can we design a performance review that enables all of those things? That could include um, making sure that everyone is asked the same questions in their performance reviews, making sure that we have self-reflection so employees are able to provide their perspective um, on the same items that their manager is reviewing them on even having multiple raters so we're not falling to maybe one person's specific biases and giving those raters a really specific structure um, to frame their feedback. I love the SBI model that you mentioned, Zach. So how can we you know, encourage and give those frameworks to, to make sure that things are happening from an ob objective place to potentially prevent some of the, that human error and bias that might um, trickle in even as we are training our managers on those things. Absolutely. And Sandra to throw to the chat that an absolutely amazing discussion. I 100% agree. There's been so much concrete things um, given to everyone. And I'm in the Q&A box now and want to pick up a couple of things from there as we have a little bit of time left. And to continue on this topic, um, there's a question uh, about what if you're not in a uh, supervisory role? So how can someone um, who is is not a leader in gentle ways um, bring up ideas or suggestions or thoughts towards this approach? What do you think? How can somebody not in a sub supervisory role um, support compassionate culture? You want me to start go off? With, yes, sorry, go first. <laughs> Of course. Um, that's a great question. I am always a proponent that it has to start from the top down, that it's not the individual employee's responsibility to create a culture of psychological safety in their organization. Um, and so if there is comfort to bring that up to your manager and even start considering how can we incorporate um, bringing that voice at the organization level. So how can we potentially have that type of item or that type of um, concept introduced in an engagement survey? How can we start a conversation around it? Even if it's just quanti qualitative data, like starting a focus group, if other people are feeling the same way, um, how can we expand it beyond that one individual so they're not feeling like it's just their responsibility, but a pattern that they're noticing that maybe we can pick up um, through additional data gathering? Yeah. Right. And um, I, I want to say plus one on especially that it's not the responsibility of the individual employees to do the culture creation. It really does come from top down. And with that said, if we're leaders, not necessarily, um, you know, a supervisor or something like that, but all of us, we're all leaders. We are all leaders with how we lead with our energy. So when we show up to a situation, we decide if we want to show up with empathy, we want to show up with compassion, if we want to show up with kindness, if you want to show up with non-judgment. And if you want to show up that way and be an authentic person, you're already contributing to a better culture of more compassion. So just by demonstrating compassion on the day to day um, with everyone that you're with, it's you, you're, you don't have to be, you know, have a title to be able to be a leader in that way. Because when people see it, even if it's somebody as small as, you know, an intern or someone who's entry level, when they are just giving you the energy and they are, again, showing the empathy, they're showing the compassion, that creates an impact. So I, I completely agree 100%. Like, it really comes from the top, end of the day. Yet, if you are somebody who's like, you know, lower, lower down on the totem pole, you still can create an impact by being your authentic self and showing your own compassion every day. 
Absolutely. And both of you kind of talked about this, but just makes me think how valuable it's also to invest in self-compassion and do all those things you do to others, to ourselves too, and start from there. Um, we have time for one more question from the question box. And I want to challenge you because the person asking says this may be an impossible question, which I don't okay. actually think is the case, but I'm sure uh, they'll get some really good um, insights for this. So how do you continue to speak up when you feel as though you're being misinterpreted? Zach, you want to go first? Yeah, well, I'd say first, um, perhaps clarify, right? If you you feel like you're be, being misunderstood, you feel like you're being misinterpreted, maybe take a pause and say, hey, it sounds like folks may be misunderstanding me. Maybe I'm being misunderstood to what my intention is behind something. So really pull back the curtain. Let people see. It's really about um, demonstrating a little bit of vulnerability at work. And we talk about this a lot of times and we, you know, we talk about you know, being vulnerability, vulnerable at work, we don't want to be seen as weak. We don't want to be seen as um, somebody who's not intelligent, but to be a little bit vulnerable and say, hey, I feel like I'm being misunderstood here and be really honest in that. I think that that can be a really good thing for, for trust building, right? Trust building is not, doesn't come from when everything is Hey, it's all happy. It's all good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm at a 10. You're at a 10. Everything is great. That's not trust. Trust is when it's like, hey, it's hitting the fan a little bit. I'm having a hard time today and I need some support from you. That's when those kinds of conversations where, where the trust is built are, hey, I'm in a situation where I feel like I'm speaking up and I'm just not being heard, right? So being able to have those moments of you know, speaking up and out. And I want to say to do so, it requires courage. So just, it's not an impossible thing, but it is a hard thing. And that's really about having courage at work and putting yourself out there, again, being vulnerable and authentic. Great. Kopal, you want to add something? I, I fully agree. I think I'll just add on to that is beyond challenging yourself to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit, even doing some thinking around like what communication styles are you most comfortable in when when you ha are having tougher conversations or are feeling like um, you're being misinterpreted? Maybe perhaps you want to write down what you're you're feeling and thinking and communicate it that way, or or find another avenue where you think you might be more effective. Um, I know that everyone has different communication styles and different comfort levels when it comes to how communicating how you're communicating things. So that can be an interesting exercise, even discussion with um, your manager, whoever you feel like is misinterpreting you um, could be could be valuable to consider. Yeah, I think always if something feels like, oh, how do I navigate through this? This is impossible situation. It calls for exploration, which both of you gave again, very practical, practical tips for how to how to start and how to approach. We are almost at the end of our session. So much good, good answers, good material. Thank you, Zach. And thank you, Kopal. I think everybody is really excited about learning and being part of this conversation today. If we didn't get to answer all of your questions, which we didn't, because I know there were many good ones that we ran out of time of to answer. Bravely and Culture Amp both have great resources. So Bravely is a training and coaching platform that specifically trains people um, at work, employees with professional personalized development and offers support in these areas and how to cultivate that compassionate leadership, compassionate culture, how to get started if you're lost. Um, so scan the QR code for more information. And then second, um, Culture Amp, an employee experience platform. There's a huge amount of information online, insights. Um, you can you can get a lot of good good uh, material from their website, and and they're they're the leading platform, right? Kopal, tell me if you want to add something specific, but um, I I know there's a lot of good material online to find, and and using this is of course even better. Um, so check out both Bravely and uh, Culture Amp. And last but not least, you'll see the codes on the screen. 
uh, unfortunately, we could have conver uh, conversated more and more, <laughs> probably hours and hours. This was so insightful, but we are at our time. Thank you so much, everyone who joined. Thank you for your active participation. Um, and any parting words from Zach or Kopal before we end the webinar? No, just thank you for, for joining in the great conversation. This was fun. Yeah, I will. I'll just plus one that this was a blast. I could I could do a whole nother hour with y'all. <laughs> Same. Thank you. This was a joy. Thank you. Thank you. And have a great rest of your day.